So there was Irving the poet and Irving the teacher, an energetic and inspiring teacher, which is how I first came to know him. The, the first day I ran into Irving Layton, he actually bounded into our class. It was the uh, first day of the new school year, Herzliya High School, junior high, grade seven. In the class are seven students, five girls, two boys. The girls are from uh, pretty well-to-do bourgeois families, mostly ultra-orthodox, closed all the way up here to down there, being prepared, you might say, fattened for marriage, and two guys from the more working class side of town. My family lived on St. Urban Street, so he comes bounding into the classroom, all physical energy, real robust, rugged, good looks, what you would today call a rock star as opposed to a typical teacher. And he doesn't say hello. He just stares at us. Long moments. First he sweeps the entire class, then he picks us out individual faces, turns his back, goes to the blackboard, picks up a piece of chalk and starts to write. Huge number nine. And then another number nine and then he stabs the blackboard so hard that the chalk breaks, this enormous squeak, but he keeps going. And then he puts up another nine and another nine and another nine and he fills the entire front blackboard with nines and when he's done with that, he goes to the other blackboard on the side of the room and he fills that with nines. And then he steps back to the front of the classroom. Still his back turns to us and he intones 99.9999999. Percent of people, and he whips around, are Philistines. <laughs> I had no idea what a Philistine was, but I decided right then and there, not me. <laughs> I, I subsequently looked up the word, and the Oxford Dictionary said a Philistine was a person with interests that were material and commonplace. And then there was another definition that seemed to make a little more sense. It was the enemy into whose hands you might fall. That seemed to be a clue. I subsequently understood that what he meant by a Philistine was somebody with a closed mind, somebody who got stuck in orthodoxy and, uh, and complacency and was not open to the fascinating turmoil of the world. And, and over time, I began to understand that this was one of his great themes, one of his two great themes, a constant fight against Canadian Philistinism and a constant fight against Canadian Puritanism. A second little anecdote has to do with the fact that a couple weeks later, he materialized again in the classroom after having been absent for a few days. And I had thought that he was perhaps ill or whatever, but he was uh, eager to tell us that he was just back from Toronto where he had launched his new book and had been widely lionized why even the CBC had come out to cover the event. And so he told me that in recognition of this glorious event that he had with him some extra copies of the book and that he would make them available to us at an unheard of low price, no middlemen involved, <laughs> 25 cents. And, and he assured us that if we didn't have the money in the moment, he would grant us credit. And if when we went home to perhaps ask for the money, we should assure our parents that these books would inevitably become collector's items <laughs> and would eventually be worth lots of money. Which is how that day the um, music on a kazoo came into my possession as the first book of Irving Layton's that I own. 
and eventually over the years for prices ranging from 15 cents all the way up to 50 cents, I, I acquired them all. Um, by the way, we used to call music on a kazoo music on a cat's ass. I mean the students. And, and then, and then he, he brought out another book, The Cold Green Element, which was known as the hot brown lump. <laughs> <laughs> but, but over time, I, I got them all. A and in addition to that, he would bring back from his various trips to Toronto books by a guy called Suster and a guy called Acorn and a guy called Purdy and, uh, and all these little chap books and things that were mimeographed. And I estimate that over the course over the next four years, grades seven to 11, I must have spent four to five dollars <laughs> on Irving Layton's work. You might say he exploited us, right? <laughs> I mean, there we were. <laughs> but, you know, I'd heard that he was a modern poet, which meant that the things didn't necessarily rhyme, the lines didn't necessarily scan, but there were forbidden words in those poems, so I thought, what the hell, I bought everything he offered in class. And the reason I'm telling you this story is there's this kind of myth afoot that, you know, poets don't represent much money, uh, don't make much money, and in fact are kind of these uh, mendicants not really capable of functioning in the real world. Uh, well, over the years, you know, I've been in, in, in uh, a fair number of deals and you win some and you lose some, and, and I've been particularly lucky in broadcasting, primarily television, but the fact is I've never made as much money as with the books that Irving Layton <laughs> sold me because in 1991, preparing for an event not dissimilar to this, I called up a guy in Toronto who I knew to be a dealer in old uh, books and particularly Canadiana. Uh, and, and I said to him, I've got this stuff. Um, uh, why, why don't you come over, look at it, and give me an appraisal? Uh, this, this was the stuff that eventually came to be known as Can Lit. And he did that appraisal in 91 and told me that the books that I'd bought for 4 to $5 were now worth 4600 and some odd dollars. This is 91. In the lobby today, <laughs> I had a look at some of those same volumes as offered by this uh, dealer here in, tr in, in Montreal. And, uh, and I would say that 4,600 bucks must have gone up double and triple and perhaps even, even more so. So um, next time they tell you that poetry doesn't pay, <laughs> you'll know that that's not the case. And uh, of course, I, I will part with a single volume and uh, I'm pleased to be here with you to share a couple of anecdotes about our great and beloved teacher, Irving Layton. Thanks very much. <laughs>